In this video, we're going to look at animal husbandry. So animal husbandry is the business of keeping animals with the intention of producing food. We will be covering it from the point of view of rearing cattle, poultry, fish and beekeeping. Let's begin with cattle. So the world over cattle is kept primarily for the production of meat and milk. Now, while rearing cattle, one has to first choose what variety of uh, cattle we want to keep based on the conditions in which they're going to be reared and also the purpose for which they're going to be reared. Let's take a look at some of these. We begin with the Red Sindhi, which is a na native Indian breed. Um, it is highly resistant to disease. It has high milk production. So these are some of the advantages and it is very cost effective from the point of view of the production of milk. Let's look at Sahiwal. This is also indigenous. It belongs to India. Uh, this breed, it also has high disease resistance. It also has high milk production, but the milk that it produces is relatively low in fat if you compare it to others like Red Sindhi. Um, why does this matter? Well, fat is important for the production of butter and certain kinds of cheese. So it depends on what, um, what the intention, what that milk is going to be used for. It's not a cow that is suitable for grazing, therefore not suitable for being taken around. It is better to feed it in one place. Now, this is Holstein Friesian. So these are, um, these their calves grow very rapidly. There is high production of milk and the high growth is important, especially from the point of view of the meat industry. So that's the reason why one would keep Holstein. But Holstein are very large cows. They're unwieldy, especially in the hills in Himachal Pradesh. These, are, these cows are not suitable unless you're going to actually keep them in one place. And as you might have seen in many villages, just in fact, getting these cows to the house sometimes becomes an ordeal because the paths are not particularly broad. So therefore, of course, in the hills, the more common, uh, the, the more common imported breed that is kept are Jersey. Jersey are comparatively small. If you see that size, small in size, they have a much longer lifespan. They are productive for a very large number of years. Their, their milk is comparatively rich in fat. Okay, so this is why Jersey is suitable. But again, Jersey is a cow. You might have seen they're not very good at actually walking on narrow paths, although better than Holstein. Now, if you look at the conditions in the hills, the most suitable, of course, is the what we call the Pahadi guy. And it is suitable for grazing. You can you'll have seen in hills in villages, they leave these cows out in the forests and they can walk quite a bit and they can graze on their own so you don't actually need to feed them at uh, one spot comparatively they eat very little because of course these are very small you will have noticed that the pahadi guy is significantly smaller than a lot of these imported uh, breeds now one of the things is the pahadi guy the production of milk is extremely low Usually at the peak of production, they will produce four to six liters of milk a day. But this milk is very good for just home consumption. It is very tasty. It's kind of yellowy, yellowish in color and creamy and actually very sweet. Um, you don't really have to add sugar to it. So as milk that is to be drunk at home, it is, um, it is in fact very tasty. But the production is very low. Then the other alternative, of course, is to not keep cows, is to keep buffaloes. Now, um, buffaloes, buffalo milk, traditionally, buffaloes yield less milk than cows, but the milk that they produce is much higher in fat. So this is one reason that you might want to keep them. In fact, in the plains, buffaloes are um, preferred quite significantly over cows. There also, they, there is no religious sentiment attached to the buffaloes as such. So that is also a big consideration in India. One of the big negatives for keeping buffaloes in the hills too, in fact, one is that they require large quantities of water. And secondly, is they're not great at walking. So especially where people have to take them across passes 
or want them to graze regularly in meadows, these are not suitable. Now, nutrition for cattle, you have normally we feed them grass, we feed them some form of fiber and that is what we call roughage. Now, other than the roughage that we might actually harvest from the land around, we might add supplements in terms of choker. So when we polish rice and wheat, we get we remove the outer surface and that is called choker. So this choker, in fact, is you can buy it in sacks and you can feed it to cattle. Now, remember, cattle produce milk and milk we know is high in protein. So where is this protein coming from? A large amount of this protein, in fact, has to be supplemented in their diet. And that we give, we often feed them grains like chana. Um, is very, it's very common to feed them things like chana because chana has high protein and that um, allows them then to produce milk. You also have what are called concentrates. So concentrates are again things we buy from the market. Remember, um, cow's milk is rich in minerals like calcium. So we have to, of course, we have to, of course, supplement the cow's diet with large amounts of calcium, vitamins, other minerals. So all of this can be give, given via what is called cattle feed concentrate. Here are just some photographs of the food supplements that we might give a cow. Now, one of the main issues, so, so far we've talked about breed selection, se selection, but one of the main issues with cattle is actually the marketing of the milk. Now, remember, if in India, most of our cattle are reared in very small numbers, right? We don't have places where we're rearing 200, 300 heads of cattle at the same time. Most of our milk production is in households where there will be two to three um, cows or two to three cows which are giving milk at a time. Now, the problem that arises from here is that this means that we'll get anywhere between 10 to 30, 10 to 30 liters of milk per day. And local consumption is often not that high. So in your village, it, if you, even if there is a demand for about, let's say, 30 liters of milk, it will be far away. So actually supplying the milk from your house to the various consumers becomes a, a task. It takes more than half a day to conduct this. Now, mm, the other issue is that also processing this, let's say making paneer, making butter, on a regular basis and actually marketing that is also not something that is feasible. So what is the solution to this, especially when you have these, um, when you have such small quantities being produced in, at a very local level. So in India, we have the cooperative dairy structure. What this means is there are cooperatives at the village level which collect the milk in fact i think in himachal if you if you have a production of 40 liters the car in fact comes to your the jeep comes to your village and picks up the milk from there from there the milk is collected it is put into pasteurization centers where the milk is first heated to 70 degrees and then rapidly cooled to kill all the bacteria and thereafter, it is sent, it might be processed at the district level where all the milk is collected and processed, either put into packets or maybe converted into butter or ghee or and paneer and other such things. And then it is marketed not only at the district level, but as a federation of cooperatives, as a collection of several cooperatives, uh, this milk is processed and then marketed. So what are these cooperatives? Um, let's take a look. We all know of uh, Amul and this is India's biggest and most successful cooperative based in Gujarat. It collects milk from millions of producers and then brings it to our doorstep in various forms. There are many others like Verka, Vita. These are based in Punjab. In Himachal, we have Kamdhenu. So all of these are basically doing that that work. One of the big things with the rearing cattle is the management of waste and pollution control. As we've seen before, um, cattle are some of the largest producers of methane in the world, contributing significantly to greenhouse gases. 
and cow dung, which is gober also in, produces a large quantity of methane. So this is one of the growing concerns with the rearing of cattle. There's also the issue that after cows are slaughtered, uh, the waste, the offal is also something that needs to be disposed of. And wherever you have very large numbers of cattle held in confined spaces, then disposal of things like urine also become an issue. Let's move on to poultry. So poultry here refers to chickens and ducks and other kinds of birds that we keep for the sake of eggs and the meat that we can get from them. So when we think of poultry farming with chickens, we can categorize chickens into three types. That is layers, broilers and parents. Now, depending, these may be the same variety of chicken. It might be the same type of chicken, but we treat them differently based on what, um, what purpose they're going to serve. So layers are those birds that we keep for the sake of eggs. The eggs are typically unfertilized eggs, which is that they, they will not produce chicks, even if they are incubated. And we want these chickens to lay eggs as frequently as possible normally between one egg a day or one egg in two days. So between these, that is how much these chickens, um, that is how frequently they lay eggs. For these chickens, very often artificial lighting is used because if you increase the amount of light that the chicken is exposed to, that increases the frequency with which they lay eggs. Second, you have broilers. These chickens are kept only for their meat. Before they reach complete maturity, they are normally taken to slaughter and they're used for meat. So here you want a chicken that grows very fast, has a lot of muscle mass because what we call meat is basically muscle. And these chickens typically are reared for about between 50 to 60 days. So from being a chick to being an adult, which is then uh, taken to slaughter, they, they are kept for a period of about 60 days. You want these chickens, as I said, to put on muscle as fast as possible. Then finally, you have parents. These are parents are basically those chickens which are kept for the sake of reproduction, producing new chicks. So not only do we want them to lay eggs, we also want them to either incubate them themselves, sit on the eggs, or they may be incubated in artificial incubators, as is the case normally. So parents are kept for breeding. These chickens have a lifespan of um, sometimes four to five years also. Nutrition is a big part of poultry farming. Uh, this is because whether you're raising it for the eggs or whether you're raising it for the meat, the main requirement is protein. As you know, eggs are high in protein and the meat that we eat is basically all protein. So how are we going to provide these chickens with this large quantity of proteins? So what we do is we chicken feed has a lot of soya bean and it has a lot of corn. Uh, sometimes we use waste from other things like fisheries uh, in the feed to boost the protein content, but basically we use soya bean and corn. Now the issue with using soya bean and corn is that these are crops that could actually go to feed human beings. So the question is in a world where there still is starvation and hunger, is it right to be doing this? So this is a big question. Uh, so we look at what is called the food conversion ratio. Okay, now what is the food conversion ratio? Food conversion ratio is the ratio of food we feed to the chicken to the amount of chicken that it produces. As an example, you can see in this graphic, the best food conversion ratio, FCR, is that of 1.31 is to 1. That means it takes 1.31 kilograms of feed to produce 1 kilogram of chicken. Now, this is extremely uncommon. Uh, if you see the USA has about a, a FCR of close to two, that means it takes two kilograms of feed to produce one kilogram of chicken. Then you have free range chickens. Free range chickens are those chickens which are not kept in large poultry farms and they are allowed to go out and uh, feed so on. So these have an FCR of about 4.1 because they have longer lifespan. So they will keep eating for a longer time. So this gives a food conver conversion ratio of four is to one. That means four kilograms of feed to one kilogram of chicken. And in Indian poultry farms, the FCR is near nearly about 2.7 is to one. So that means it takes almost three kilos of feed to produce one kilogram of chicken. 
another big factor with um, poultry farming is disease. So um, salmonella is a very common disease that they get and this causes the chickens to develop diarrhea and uh, loose motions essentially. And what happens is that one bird that has diarrhea is able to infect all the other birds in its vicinity. And this spreads from bird to bird and often, in fact, wipes out entire flocks of these uh, chickens being raised. So this is a this is a serious concern. Also, the presence of salmonella on the eggs mm, is a, is a possible source of food contamination for human beings. Along with this, you must have heard of bird flu, the H1N1 virus. So this is of a special concern because it it managed to cross over from chickens. The disease managed to cross over onto wild birds. And about a few years ago, there were reports from the different cities of India where, where birds were just falling from trees, falling dead from trees because of the H1N1 virus. And at that time, people had to actually cull entire populations of uh, poultry farms. Now, one of the things is that because chickens live in these poultry farms, chickens live very close to each other, we cannot allow the birds to actually fall ill. So one of the strategies, commonly used strategies, is to feed them antibiotics with their food. Now, um, not only does this prevent disease, it was also found that in broilers, the putting the antibiotics actually, um, putting the antibiotics actually helps the chicken gain weight and the chickens become plump very fast. But the negative side of this is one is, of course, that eating this meat which contains these antibiotics cannot be good for uh, human beings on a long on the long term because we are exposing ourselves to these antibiotics and also exposing the bacteria inside our body to small doses of antibiotics such that the the bacteria may actually develop resistance and resistance to these antibiotics is also a problem that chickens face is that many of the many of the diseases that affect poultry are now immune to these antibiotics because of this kind of exposure. So this is in fact one of the um, big concerns in facing the poultry industry today. So let's come to fishing now. Mm, so there are broadly two types of fishing. One is marine fishing, that's fishing in the seas and oceans and freshwater fishing. Uh, that is fishing in ponds and lakes and rivers. <clears throat> there are also two different ways of obtaining fish. One is by capture, which means going with nets and rods and other such things and catching wild fish and the other is fish farming um, where we actually grow the fish in tanks, ponds, rivers and sometimes in the oceans also and we grow these fish and then we then later on harvest them for use. In India mostly um, when it comes to marine fish we use capture which means we take boats or inshore we lay nets and we catch these wild populations of fish. And um, when it comes to freshwater, we don't have such large uh, freshwater bodies or where we have dams, for example, and we get these large lakes. There, what we tend to do is we tend to grow the fish. The government, in fact, puts in young fish and then gives out contracts for fishing. So that is fish farming. So let's look at these two briefly. If we begin with marine fish, marine fish today is a very high tech business. Uh, you can see on the left hand side is a picture of a trawler. A trawler is a mechanized boat for fishing. These have large trawling nets, many of which are one or two kilometers long they can be. And these nets are lowered mechanically into the water. And then there's a motor that pulls them back in with these large quantities of fish. They also have satellite communication using which they are able to track using satellite photographs. They're able to track large schools of very valuable fish like tuna and they chase these schools of fish down and they are able to capture them. Then they also within the same boat, they have processing and refrigerating plants where they can clean the fish and um, store the fish in sub zero temperatures so that they can go from many day voyages they can go for weeks at a time capture the fish clean them and freeze them so that when they come back to shore they are ready for sales now one of the big problems of 
marine fishing at this huge scale is the problem of bycatch. So when you put a net in the ocean and you pull out the fish uh, that you're looking for, you also catch a large number of fish which you don't want or these fish that are either too small to eat or that cannot be eaten for various reasons. This is called bycatch. This is a waste product and very often the bycatch is in fact just thrown back into the sea. Now these fish are not alive because when you're pulling out the net, just the pressure of so many fish, one on each other, causes this bycatch to die. So it's essentially a huge waste and very destructive. Um, so what people started doing was that they'd collect this bycatch and sell the bycatch also because the bycatch was then being used either for fertilizers or it was being used to create fish feed for um, for inland, for freshwater fisheries. It was being used as, it was being converted to fish feed. But this creates an additional problem, which was at least earlier, the bycatch was a waste and it had no economic value to these trawlers. But today the trawlers don't waste their bycatch, but because it is giving them some price, they can go on for longer and longer trying to catch the fish that they want. We'll come to this. In this slide, we see the mat. We are going to address the matter of sustainability. When we fish at the, with these huge trawlers at this huge level, is it something that we can keep doing or is it unsustainable? So on the X axis, you'll find the number of fishing trips, the amount of time we are spending in sea. On the Y axis, for the red graph, the red line, you can see fishing costs. So it's clear that the more time we spend at sea, the higher the cost will be. The cost of fuel, the cost of people, and just the cost of having that boat out. So as time goes by, the cost also keeps increasing steadily. Now, if we look at fish yield, how much fish we get from the trip, we find that if up to a certain level, let's say point A, which is the maximum economic yield, Every time we fish, we pull out we pull out enough fish to give us some profit, but we leave enough fish in the water so that the next time we come back, the fish have had there were enough fish left behind, and uh, those fish are able to breed and grow so that the next time we come back, we still have um, we still have adequate fish populations in that area. So let's say we have a school of 100 fish and we capture, let's say, 30 or 40 fish from those 100. The next time we come back, we'll find that the 100 have replenished themselves. We almost have the original 100. We can fish again. Then you come to point B, which is the maximum sustainable fish. Let's say the um, maximum sustainable yield. Let's say that we go to an area and from the school of 100 fish, we capture, let's say, 45 to 50 fish. When we come back the next time, we might find that they have just about recovered. We just about have that 100 fish or maybe a little less. So this is the maximum economic um, sustainable yield. After this point, the fishing becomes unsustainable. Why? Because let's say from a school of 100 fish, we capture 70 or 80. By the time we come back the next time, we find that the fish populations have in fact reduced and there are only 50 to 60 fish left in that school. So now what happens is the second time we go, of course, our expectation is that we're going to catch 50 to 60 fish. So we'll catch another 50 to 60 fish, leaving behind only 10. So as you can see, the fish populations in that area are decreasing. So this is an example of unsustainable fishing. And what unsustainable fishing does is it also increases the amount of time I have to spend because as the fish become more and more sparse, we have to spend more and more time trying to catch those same fish. So the fishing costs also go up. So um, what we find today is that the marine fishing industry is becoming more and more technologically driven, but this is becoming more and more unsustainable. Now, freshwater fishing has many forms and um, in large parts of India, in villages, you have several ponds and in these ponds, fish are grown and then maybe um, using the rods, they are harvested or once or a few times a year, they are harvested using nets. This is common throughout the country, but we're going to stick to trout farming 
um, particularly because this is relevant to Himachal Pradesh. Um, it's not the largest in Himachal Pradesh. The dams that we have are in fact the largest producers of fish. But um, trout farming is something that can only be done where the water is very cold. So there are only few states, Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal, Uttarakhand and some northeastern states. These are the only states where trout can be grown because trout requires cold water. So just to give you an idea, trout farming begins with the growing of what are called fingerlings, which are very small fish. And they must be reared in special tanks, which are kept indoors to keep the temperature under control and to keep the feeding and aeration under control. So they're fed regularly. The water is aerated. Remember, they need oxygen in the water. So the air is bubbled through the water and the water has to be periodically changed to keep the water clean. So these are indoor breeding tanks. And then once the fish reach a certain size, they are released into these outdoor tanks, which you must have seen if you have ever driven by along the banks of the rivers like Tirthan or um, the Bayas, okay, and the, some, some parts of the Satluj. So these are, you'll have these long tanks, which you can see on the right hand side. These are these long tanks where these trouts, the, the slightly mature uh, trout are released and they are allowed to grow up to be between three and four years. Um, they are fed constantly. The water from the river is diverted and it keeps replacing this water, keeping the water fresh and the water must be aerated constantly. And after three to four years, the fish is basically ready for harvest and sale. Finally, we come to beekeeping. This is something many of you will be familiar with. Those of you who have been to the apple growing belt during the months of, let's say, between March and June, you would have seen these boxes, like on the picture on the left hand side. These are actually portable beehives. These are beehives in boxes and they contain honeybees. Now, what happens is these honeybees are reared by beekeepers and what the beekeepers do is during the pollination season in apples that happens between March and May, they will go orchard to orchard. People will come to these beekeepers and they will rent, take these beehives on rent, anything between 2,500 to 3,500 for a period of two to three weeks. They will pay rent for these boxes, take them to their orchards and place them. Now, why? Because while the trees are flowering, you need an insect to pollinate the apples. If there is no pollination, you don't get a fruit. Okay, the flower just falls off. And during this period of flowering, there are so many apple trees that there are not enough wild insects for pollination. So during this time, what you need to do is you need to actually have these beehives placed. So they're taken on rent and after the flowering is over, these rents, these boxes are returned to the beekeeper and then what the beekeeper does is he moves from the lower heights where the flowering takes place first to the middle heights where it takes place a little later and then to the upper heights where the flowering takes place right at the end but how about the season when there are when there is no flowering well that is the season during which the beekeeper actually has to feed these bees a little bit of honey and it's not only apples but many other crops are also uh, reliant on um, on the pollination of bees for example mustard so in the winter months these same hives are taken right down to the plains or to areas where large fields of mustard are there and they are placed near the mustard fields and then these uh, pollinate the mustard flowers apart from pollination of course one of the big economic benefits of keeping bees is honey production so inside those boxes, you have these frames, which are shown here on the left hand side. And these frames, some frames are left undisturbed so that the bees, the bees, of course, reproduce in these uh, frames. They lay the egg, the queen lays her eggs and they hatch into larvae and then into bees in these frames. But those frames which are new and don't contain the eggs or larvae, um, they are removed from time to time and they put in something called a centrifuge you can see that picture on the right which spins these frames round and round and the honey comes out and the honey is harvested you can also see the top layer is actually a layer of what is called beeswax and beeswax also has economic value so this is another useful byproduct of honey 
one of the big concerns in the um, in the beekeeping industry is of late we found there's large die offs of the bee population that means large quantities of bees are just dying and people say it's the combination of disease and pesticide use etc we're not entirely sure but this is one of the big concerning things because if there if we don't have both domestic and wild bees we will find that food production in the world itself will take a major beating so this is an area of ongoing research